Well, good morning, Turning Point. How are you guys doing? It's good to see you. It's good to be back. We lost a year, but no one even remembers that year, so it just figured like it was just last year that I was here. So uh, it's always good to hang out with George and Angie, and um, they have been dear friends to us, and so it's a privilege to be with you and see what God is doing here uh, in and through Turning Point. The stories I hear about you and the way that you're loving your community is amazing. Um, today, I want to talk to you out of, how many of you know John 3.16? Anybody? All right. How many of you know 1 John 3.16? All right, so we're going to memorize that one, all right? So 1 John 3.16, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need and has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and truth. This is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. Anybody's heart need a little rest? If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts, and he knows everything. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask. Because we keep his commands and do what pleases him. And this is his command. To believe in the name of his son Jesus and to love one another as he commanded us. The one who keeps his command lives in him and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. Now John is the disciple who Jesus loved, Scripture says. His closest friend in the world. And, but he's a guy from the Middle East. And Middle Easterners, they don't think deductively the way that we think. They think inductively. And so John's main point is going to be the last thing he said. Okay, we always, you know, in journalism they say, uh, lead, don't bury the lead line. You know, boy, hit by a car, whatever it is, it's, they just lead with that, right? Um, but in the uh, Near East, they save it to the last. It's the punchline. So we're going to flip this passage upside down as we study it today. And we're going to start off with verse 24, 23 and 24. This is his command, command duh, not command zuh. This is his command, to believe in the name of his son Jesus and to love one another as he commanded us. The one who keeps his commands, z to believe in his son Jesus and love one another, all right, lives in him and he in them. So how is that possible? How is it possible for us to live in him and he to live in us, he tells us. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. The first thing I want to talk to you about is when you're in love, you know it, right? When you're in love, you know it. And what he says here is this, how do you know? You know because you have the spirit of Christ Jesus in you. This is the missing ingredient in evangelical circles today, that the litmus test for knowing whether or not you're a child of God is not whether you go and sit forward and listen to some guy talk once a week, or whether you go to life group and act, you know, share and care, all right, although that's wonderful and important, or whether you go and serve at the soup kitchen, or whether you check all the boxes of the religious shuffle that people give you to do. The way that you know for sure that you're a follower of Jesus Christ, as Romans 8 tells us, his spirit testifies to our spirit that we're a child of God. One of the biggest problems today is that we're caught up in a mixed covenant world. A buddy of mine, I went to see him recently, and he has an old riding lawnmower, and it's rusted, and, and it's... It looks like a bucket of bolts, and then he's got a brand new, one of those zero-turn jobbies. And I said, man, I, I see you got a new mower. He goes, yeah. I said, that old mower's great. But, you know, if you're going to start it, you got to hold this here and jerry that there and, and then hit it three times, and, and then it'll start. And I said, okay. And if you're going to mow around the tree, you gotta, then you got to take the bag off you know, to get close enough to the tree. And, and if, 
if you want to keep it maintained and running, then every year you got to take the belt off, change the oil, sharpen the blade. Then you can get a season out of it. And I said, well, tell me about your new mower. He says, oh, man, it never needs maintenance. Starts right up, no problem. Go around that tree, never have to worry about the bag. And I said, so why don't you get rid of this one? He goes, well, I won't give that to anybody. Then they'll have to get a new mower like I had to get a new mower because this one, only I know how to start it, and this one won't trim around a tree, and this one. And so what he's, he, he's telling me two things. He said, this old one's good. It still works. But this new one works and it's way better. It does everything the old one would do and even more. Is there anything wrong with it? No, it still works. It's just not any good. Now let me ask you, raise your hand if you want the old mower. If, then. If you do this, then it works. Nobody wants the old mower. How many of you want the new mower? No maintenance. Does everything you need to do, just start it up, fire it, go do it. Same thing. The New Testament is the new mower. There's nothing wrong with this one. It's an if-then mower. It still works. If-then. If you can keep all the commandments perfectly, then you get to go to heaven. But no one can keep the old, all of them done. The new covenant is, oh, it's no maintenance. Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And as a result, you will love others. Why? Because the spirit of Christ Jesus now lives in you, giving you the capacity to do so. But we were raised, I don't know about you, I'm a Baptist preacher's kid. I was raised with one foot in the old covenant and one foot in the new. Boy, if you do that, you're going to wind up splitting hell wide open. Anybody raised like that? All right. And then, for by the grace of God, you've been saved. And I'm like, which is it? I don't know. I really want to know. All right. We were raised with a healthy dose of fear. And so most of us walk around like, well, I got my Trump check. and I better tithe on it or else my transmission's going to fall out. <laughs> right? And then we get... You know, oh, the hell, world's going to hell in a handbasket and COVID and the election and people are mad and the Facebook's angry. And, and so we get over here and we go, if my people who are called by my name, what we need right now is just everyone to get on their knees and pray and then God will swoop down and rescue us. We still believe that. <clears throat> this more over here says, I sent my son to die on the cross for you that whoever would believe in me would receive the indwelling presence and power of the Holy Spirit. I already swooped down. You guys are praying and waiting on something that already happened. Quit asking for me to do it again. I already did it. Now live it. It's in you. It's in you. And if you're like me, I'm 50, almost 54 this year. I had never heard that. I was 45 at a pastor before I ever really understood, oh, the other shoe's not going to drop. It's grace and grace and more grace. And I've got everything on board that I'm ever going to need. And if you and I will begin to live by the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. That's how the world is transformed and changed. So he says, stop living for God to do something to you and start allowing God to do something through you. Listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. What's the last thing that the Holy Spirit of God placed upon you he nudged you to do. He inspired you to do. He, he encouraged you to do. The second thing he goes, he says, not only do you, when you're in love do you know it, when you're in love, you live it. When you're in love, it just comes out of you. There's an old Bruce Springsteen song, and he's like, I will drive all night again just to buy you some shoes. How many of you have been in love like that? Yeah, you remember. 
you would have drove halfway across the country just to sneak a kiss outside the window of a parent's house. And he said, when, you love, when you're in love, you know it. He says, dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with action and truth. This is how we know that we belong to the truth, how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. How? How do we know that we belong to the truth and set our hearts at rest? We live in an active response to the Holy Spirit of God. Not to a bunch of coulds and shoulds and ought tos. Well, I ought to go to life group, but I hate it because she just yammers and yammers and yammers and yammers. She will not shut up. Well, I ought to go down and serve at the thing, and I ought to do this, and I ought to do that. No, no, no. No, that's garbage. That's Old Testament legalism that we, the church, have yoked on one another for 60, 70 years. And we don't know any better. We just grew up in it. And we think that's the way it is. And then when you start reading the New Testament, you start seeing it through the lens of grace and the lens of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 15, they had a whole council. They had to have a big, giant church meeting to figure out how can these Gentile people follow Jesus? How can they? I thought only Jews are the true worshipers of God. And they said, no, no, they've received the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the litmus test. It is the central issue of the New Testament. How do you know for sure that you're a follower of Jesus? You live in right relationship with the living internal God who is in you. And if you haven't developed a conversational relationship with the Holy Spirit of God, if you don't know for sure that the Holy Spirit of God dwells in you, I don't care if you walk the aisle at VBS when you were six. I don't care if you were baptized in the Jordan River. I don't care if you are part of the women's whatever and the men's this and whatever. It doesn't matter. If you don't have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit of God, you are not a child of God. You do not have the capacity to ride this mower over here. You're still over here trying to hit it three times. If, then. And I'm not trying to scare you. I grew up under that. I got saved about 14 times when I was a kid coming up because they just scare the heck out of you. And we'll watch a thief in the night at camp and go, oh, God, oh, boy. hallelujah. You know, I, I, I don't want, I, I, no. That's not the gospel. The gospel is there's someone who loves you so very much that they would lay down their life for you so that you could come home and oh, by the way, if you've received that kind of love and you've received his spirit, I want you to love that way. I want you to love that way. You can go to church and not love that way. And you can write a treatise on Facebook about how wrong the West, rest of the world is. And you might be right. But in your heart, you're wrong because it's not full of love and compassion and grace. He says, I want you to live beyond words. I want you to put actions to this faith of yours. Compelled and led by the Holy Spirit, it will look like love. It won't be emojis and thoughts and prayers. It'll be action. It'll be tangible. And then he says this, it's how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. Some of you are full of anxiety. Some of you are full of worry. Some of you are full of fear. I spent seven years on depression meds. I know a thing or two about anxiety and stress. You try sitting on a front row when you're getting ready to call it up to be preached and you don't feel like you can catch a breath. You're about to pass out. That's anxiety and stress. And you got to get off that treadmill of, oh, dang, I I, I mean, I'm going to get ready to go stand up there. And yesterday I cussed at my neighbor and told my wife she was ugly. And I didn't do any of those things. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you know how it is. You start judging yourself. You start beating yourself up. 
Like, I have no business preaching up here if they only knew. And you're just beating yourself up, and you're sitting there going, if, then. Because I didn't get the if right, I don't deserve to be usable to God. And some of you are derailed because you clicked on a porn site or because you drank too much that night or because, you know, you cheated on your taxes or because whatever. And you're just like, well, God can't use me now. All right, the person without sin, you don't need to be here. Just go ahead. You, you're free to leave. The person without sin, you're the only one usable to God, so get out there and go, go get busy doing some things because you're the only one God can use. Go, go ahead. Nobody left. You want to experience peace and rest? Here's what he says. He says, first of all, discern the Holy Spirit of God. Now, I'm going to challenge you. Don't leave here today without doing this. What is the last thing that you know the Holy Spirit of God spoke to you about, nudged you about, impressed upon you? Some of you are like, well, I don't know what you're talking about. I mean, you have your highlight reel moments. He's speaking to you every day. All the time. And because we don't know how to apprehend his truth, well, isn't that a little crazy, Pastor Jeff? It's not like, you know, hey, look, when the Holy Spirit of God speaks to you, you can take it straight to God's word, and you can make sure it lines up with his, you know, his scripture. If it's not in keeping with the character of God or the word of God, then it's probably not the spirit of God. All right? But you get a job offer. And the job offer is to move to Ohio for $500 million a year. All right? And you're like, well, still not enough to go to Ohio. But it's compelling, you know, whatever. How do you know? It doesn't say any in here, Jeff, thou shalt go to Ohio. It doesn't say that. So how do you know? You know because you have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit of God. So you come before the Holy Spirit of God. And you seek God's wisdom and truth, and he will give you insight. He will give you a peace. And if you know the voice of God, my sheep, they know my voice, then you'll discern. And guess what? I challenge people all the Why is it that God only tells you to take the better paying job? Why is it that God tells you to only marry the better looking woman? Why is it that God only tells you to, to do the, the thing that you want to do? We've got to be honest with ourselves and make sure that we know what the Holy Spirit of God is leading us to. And directing us to do. And when you do that, then you step out in faith and follow the Holy Spirit. And he says, when you do that, you experience rest. You experience rest. Why? Because there's no better place to be than in the perfect will of God. Because you know that he has your best interest in mind. You know that you're a dearly loved son and daughter of the king of kings. And regardless of what he's asking you to do, you know it's for your good, even if you don't want to. And he says, that's how you experience peace. When you experience anxiety, you're living over here thinking, I've got to do this in order to get that. It's the Coke machine God. I need a Dr. Pepper, so I'm going to put this action in. I'm going to go to life group. I'm going to do that, and then I hit the God button, and boom, I get, I get out of it. He says, no, 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 I don't want that. I don't want a transactional if-then relationship. I want a living, breathing, loving communication relationship with you. Let me ask you again. How many of you know for sure that the Holy Spirit of God dwells in you? Right? The second thing is this. If the Holy Spirit of God does live you, why are you living off of yesterday's highlight reel? Some of you got a goose bump in the worship s- service today where there's a certain line of a certain song and your hand went up and you. What was that? That's the Holy Spirit of God. But we're not trained to discern and ask, Lord, what is it you're saying there? What is it you're saying there? What is it you're speaking to me? 
What truth are you speaking over me? What are you, what are you leading me to do? Because it is impossible to please God apart from faith. Impossible to please God apart from faith. So therefore, it's deductible to understand one thing. Whenever God is speaking, he's either strengthening our faith or asking us to step out in faith. He's either affirming and confirming what we already believe and know to be true about him. You're God's daughter and you're God's son. And he's absolutely pleased with you and you're nothing you can do to mess it up. Or he's saying, I want you to trust me in this. And you're watching that. Man, I was watching uh, Elton John, Rocket Man. And this is how God shows up. And there's a scene, and Elton John's in rehab. And he's lived this crazy, reckless life, ends up in rehab. And um, then there's this, it's kind of a weird musical. I don't typically like musicals, but I like Elton John, so it worked out. And uh, he, he encounters his little four-year-old self, this prodigy on the piano. And he kneels down, and the little boy says, are you going to hug me? And Elton John reaches out and hugs the little boy. And I just lost it. I started crying. Of course, I cried at McDonald's commercials. But anyway, <laughs> I started crying. And so I've, I've learned to attune my ear to God. I said, God, what is it you're saying here? He said, Jeff, you need, to, you need to make peace with that boy. You need to make peace with that. That boy who was reckless and rebellious and had been abused and was angry. You need to make peace with that little boy. So I go to my journal, and I write down. You know what the name of that one is? It's called Rocket Man. And I know, when I say in my journal entry, Rocket Man, I know what the Lord so told me that day. I know what he asked of me that day. And so by faith, I will listen, discern, and follow the will of God. And in that moment, what I experience is peace. All right, final thing. Here's what it looks like. Now remember, we're inductive, so we started with the end. Live by the power of the Holy Spirit. Put your faith in action, not just mere words. If you're not actively loving someone and actively responding to the Holy Spirit of God, you're just doing thoughts and prayers. Oh, you're in my thoughts and prayers. Okay? Then he goes to the top and he says, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. That's easy. I love my brother. And I did his son's uh, wedding last weekend. Oh, except he's not talking about those people. He's talking about brothers and sisters. He's talking about not the people that you know you already love. You love your grandkids, and you love your kids, and you love your, your well, you should anyway, but you know what I'm saying. Um, those, those people, it's easier to love them. But it's the people in your community. It's the people around you. That's who he's talking about. And he's saying, you ought to lay down your lives for them. He's saying what love looks like is what Jesus did. It's sacrificial. It's not self-serving. It costs you something, in other words. Ask yourself this. When's the last time I served someone else who wasn't my immediate family? And it actually cost me something. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need and has no pity on them, you pull up to the light, you see the guy sitting there with panhandling, and you go, dang, man, let's get a job. Has no pity on them. Well, you know he's probably just going to go run off and buy drugs anyway. Has no pity on them. How can that person, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear, dear children, let us not love that way. What love looks like is it's sacrificial and it's selfless. It's agape love. And everywhere in 1 John, he uses the term agape, differentiating the types of love that there are. And you've heard this a thousand times, but let me just go over it real briefly for you. You can say, 
you love your dad, and you can say you love your grandbaby, and you can say uh, you love your favorite football team, and you can say you love your wife, and you can say you love pizza. And we use one word for all of those things ubiquitously, and you say, oh, baby, I love you, and I love pizza. It means so much to her. <laughs> she just gets warm and fluttery when you compare her to a pepperoni pie. <laughs> but in the Greek, they use different words words for love. And what John is saying here is agape love, the kind of love that God loves with. The kind of love that God places in you by the power of his Holy Spirit. The kind of love that God wants to see flowing out of you looks like the way he loved you and the way he loved you is with his son Jesus. Selfless and sacrificial. And Jesus pulled up to the stoplight. And he saw us sitting there. And we didn't shower in days because of our sin, because we love to gossip like crazy. And we like to be mean spirited and talk behind people's backs. And we like to be malicious and critical on our Facebook posts, just ripping someone a new one because we disagree with them. And we were sitting there at that light, and he pulled up, and he didn't say, Hey, get a job. If you would just work hard and not mess up, then I could love you. If you would just do what I asked you to do and keep these commands, there's only 10 of them for crying out loud, then he didn't do that. He pulled up to the curb and he saw us and he had great compassion. And so he laid down his life. He invited us to get in the car. He said, you need a shower. You need a warm meal. You need to, I'll take you to a shelter. I'll take care of you. And with selflessness and sacrifice, he restored us into right relationship. And he says to you, go and do the same. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. All right, I'm going to teach you the five R's. You ready? You got your notes? If not, I hope you're good. Remember. All right, first thing you do, R number one, you receive. All right? You're reading, whole, you're reading scripture, and something jumps out at you. All right? Just like Brandon, when he was reading that passage of scripture, and he just hammered that one part that just jumped out. But God. Right? So you receive. Or you could be watching Rocket Man, and the Holy Spirit just jumps all over that moment. He works through 80s music. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> all right? And so you receive. And then you reflect. So R number two, you reflect. After you've received truth or a nudge, you reflect on it. You say, is this true? Is this in keeping with God's word? Is it in keeping with God's character? And then you say, what is he trying to say? What is he, what is, how, why did that move me? Why did my goosebumps go up? Why did I start crying? Why did I feel pain? Whatever it is, and you reflect, and then you, then you record R number three. Write it down. I believe God said to me, make peace with that boy. I believe God said, get off your butt and go. I believe God said, Forgive her. Quit being so nasty. I believe God said, you know what? Take a break from Facebook. I believe God said, and you write it down. Record. Now, if you really want to put some skin in the game, the next R, the fourth R, is relate. You pick up the phone and you say, hey, George, man, I was watching this movie, and I think God told me something. It does two things. One, it puts skin in the game. You know, six months from now, George can walk up to me and say, and I'm yammering about something. He says, man, I thought God told you to make peace with that kid. You're right, he did. Or, it puts skin in the game by holding you accountable. And when you say it out loud, it becomes real and tangible. Okay? And then the final thing is, is to respond. 
do what God asks you to do. God said, seek her forgiveness, go seek her forgiveness. If God said, take a break from Facebook, then take a break from Facebook. And once you do that, you will experience the peace of God. And here's the last thing, and I could preach for another hour on this topic, and you'd be asleep by then. But the, the issue is this. Brain science shows that love relationships are built on the right side of the brain. So you're looking at your baby, and you're going, goo, 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 boo, doo, 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 and the baby's going, ah, da, 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 da. Right? And that creates attachment. And the right side of the brain is blowing up. All right? Discipleship, reading the Bible, listening, is linear, and it's the left side of the brain. It's the logical, rational left side of the brain. Does not create attachment. What creates attachment, the definition of joy scientifically, is when you experience the pleasure of somebody else taking pleasure in you. And so that's why a baby sees you smile and the baby gets, and that's why you're changing the baby's diaper and you go like this and the baby starts crying because it sees the displeasure on your face. But when you go like this and the baby sees you taking pleasure in them, then all of a sudden they're happy. And so that's what, that's what he says in John 15. He says, abide in me and I will abide in you produce much fruit so that my joy, my joy, God's joy might be made complete. He takes pleasure when we're taking pleasure in him. And the way that we take pleasure in him is when we're in a love relationship with him and his spirit speaks and we respond to his spirit and we say, yes, I'm in love with you. I would drive all night just to buy you some shoes. You bet I'll do it. And we do that, and he goes, wow, his joy is made complete. And when his joy is made complete, then we're completely at peace and at rest. If you're not living that way, you're missing out. You're missing out on the life that Christ died to bring us. And most of the people I know are riding an old lawnmower, an if-then lawnmower. <coughs> if they do this, then it'll all work out. And Jesus said, man, I want you to live differently. I'm not saying that the old covenant is bad. I'm just saying it's old. And if you want to live in this new tractor, then you got to learn to operate it completely differently. It's not about oughts and shoulds. It's about my Holy Spirit and loving me. And it's easy to obey when you're in love. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the truth of your word. Lord, I pray that as you said, when we receive your spirit, you will lift the veil and we will see clearly. I pray that insight is taking place this morning, that your Holy Spirit is speaking and nudging and people are hearing and responding and begin to live the adventure. I pray if there's anyone in here who's walked an aisle, who's said the magic words, but not convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt that the Holy Spirit resides in them. I pray, Lord God, you would draw them to yourself. For anyone, Lord God, who's been stuck, I pray that you would drag them out once again and let them know that they're loved and there's not anything that needs to be done for them to be usable. They just need to start living out of that love relationship with you. So may your peace rest upon them now and may your face shine upon them and may they experience your joy. In Christ's name I pray, amen.